please read aloud. Um, today we have David Debin and Karen Simonian. David is from the History Department, and Karen is with the Wexner Center. And they're reading Julia and Joyce. I forgot the rest of it. Two 50s Outsiders. Okay, so I will turn it over to them. Well, this is a dual event, but the concept uh, makes sense in that the two books deal are both memoirs of people who were who didn't do the conventional 50s thing during the era of Ike and Mamie Eisenhower. In other words, they didn't move to the suburbs, live the life that you might see uh, in on Liebe de Viver, for example. And the I'm dealing with Julia Child, whom I'm, I suspect everyone in this room knows about, and knows about even more now that there's this movie, Julia and Julia, which some of you may s have seen. Um, the, the catalyst for my interest in this book, I don't read a lot of books for pure pleasure anymore because if you're an historian, there's too much to read. But every so often I succumb to the temptation. And uh, you really know it's tempting when I actually buy a new hardback book, which my spouse will assure you I almost never do. <laughs> so I almost never buy a new paperback book anymore. But Julia Child was interesting to me because she was, in her, own, in her own way, a revolutionary. She helped make a big change, and a kind of unlikely revolutionary in a lot of different ways. So when her memoir appeared, I thought, well, I should look at that. So I went to the bookstore and looked at it, and was seduced by how well-written it was from the first page. So, uh, so we, I bought it when it came out in 2006. It's now on the bestseller list again, and maybe higher up because of the movie. And it's the classic example. The movie is good. We saw the movie together. We liked the movie. The book is better. Read the book. Uh -huh. So I say this not to please the librarian sitting in front of me, but because it's true. Um, and so I have a few excerpts I would like to read from this memoir entitled My Life in France, published in 2006, two years after she died, and three years or so before the movie came out. Um, okay. So the first excerpt takes place they are just, they have just arrived, Julia Child and her husband Paul, in France. It's November 3rd, 1948. He works for the State Department. He does exhibits. He puts them together. And he's got the, one of the best exhibitor jobs in the world at the U.S. Embassy in Paris. And she is coming along in true sort of 50s era fashion as the spouse. She has no official job. She has had French in school but can't speak a word of it. She's never been to France before, et cetera. She describes herself earlier in the book as a rather loud, unserious 36-year-old Californian, six foot two. And perhaps crucially, she knows nothing about cooking. All right, so here's, here we are. They get off the boat at 5 a.m. They clear customs by 7 a.m. They claim their small blue station wagon, nicknamed the Flash. And then they drive to Rouen. And so here we go. At 12.30, we flashed, the car turning into a verb, into Rouen. We passed the city's ancient and beautiful clock tower and then its famous cathedral, still pockmarked from battle, but magnificent with its stained glass windows. We rolled to a stop in La Place de Vieux Marché, the square where Joan of Arc met her, fire, <coughs> met her fiery fate, and there the Michelin guide directed us to Restaurant La Couronne, the crown which had been built in 1345 in a medieval quarter-timbered house. Paul strode ahead, full of anticipation, but I hung back, concerned that I didn't look chic enough, that I wouldn't be able to communicate, and that the waiters would look down their long Gallic noses at us Yankee tourists. It was warm inside, and the dining room was a comfortably old-fashioned brown and white space, neither humble nor luxurious. At the far end was an enormous fireplace with a rotary spit on which something was cooking that sent out heavenly aromas. We were greeted by the maitre d'hôtel, a slim middle-aged man with dark hair who carried himself with an air of gentle seriousness. Paul spoke to him and the maitre d' smiled and said something back in a familiar way as if they were old friends. Then he led us to a nice table not far from the fireplace. The other customers were all French, and I noticed that they were treated with exactly the same courtesy as we were. Nobody rolled their eyes at us 
or stuck their nose in the air. Actually, the staff seemed happy to see us. As we sat down, I heard two businessmen in gray suits at the next table asking questions of their waiter, an older, dignified man who gesticulated with a menu and answered them at length. What are they talking about? I whispered to Paul. The waiter is telling them about the chicken they ordered, he whispered back. How it was raised, how it will be cooked, what side dishes they can have with it, and which wines would go with it best. Wine, I said, at lunch? I had never drunk much wine other than some $1.19 California Burgundy, and certainly not in the middle of the day. In France, Paul explained, good cooking was regarded as a combination of national sport and high art, and wine was always served with lunch and dinner. The trick is moderation, he said. Suddenly the dining room filled with wonderfully intermixing aromas that I sort of recognized but couldn't name. The first smell was something oniony. Shallots, Paul identified it, being sautéed in fresh butter. What's a shallot? I asked sheepishly. You'll see, he said. Then came a warm and whiny fragrance from the kitchen, which was probably a delicious sauce being reduced on the stove. This was followed by a whiff of something astringent, the salad being tossed in a big ceramic bowl with lemon, wine vinegar, olive oil, and a few shakes of salt and pepper. My stomach gurgled with hunger. I couldn't help noticing that the waiters carried themselves with a quiet joy, as if their entire mission in life was to make their customers feel comfortable and well-tended. One of them glided up to my elbow. Glancing at the menu, Paul asked him questions in rapid-fire French. The waiter seemed to enjoy the back and forth with my husband. Oh, how I itched to be in on their conversation. Instead, I smiled and nodded uncomprehendingly, although I tried to absorb all that was going on around me. We began our lunch with a half dozen oysters on the half shell. I was used to bland oysters from Washington and Massachusetts, which I had never much cared for. But this platter of Portuguese had a sensational briny flavor and a smooth texture that was entirely new and surprising. The oysters were served with rounds of pan de seigle, a pale rye bread with a spread of unsalted butter. Paul explained that as with the wine, the French have crews of butter, special regions that produce individually flavored butters. Beurre de Charente is a full-bodied butter, usually recommended for pastry dough or general cooking. Beurre de Signy is a fine, light table butter. It was the delicious Isigny that we spread on our rounds of rye. Rouen is famous for its duck dishes, but after consulting the waiter, Paul des decided to order sole meunier. It arrived whole, a large, flat Dover sole that was perfectly browned in a sputtering butter sauce with a sprinkling of chopped parsley on top. The waiter carefully placed the platter in front of us, stepped back and said, Bon appétit. I closed my eyes and inhaled the rising perfume. Then I lifted a forkful of fish to my mouth, took a bite, and chewed slowly. The flesh of the sole was delicate, with a light but distinct taste of the ocean that blended marvelously with the brown butter. I chewed slowly and swallowed. It was a morsel of perfection. In Pasadena, where she grew up, we used to have broiled mackerel for Friday dinners, codfish balls with egg sauce, poached salmon on the 4th of July, and the occasional pan-fried <clears throat> trout when camping in the Sierras. But at La Couronne, I experienced fish and a dining experience of a higher order than any I'd ever had before. Along with our meal, we happily downed a whole bottle of Pouilly Fumé, a wonderful crisp white wine from the Loire Valley. Another revelation. Then came Salade Verte, laced with a lightly acidic vinaigrette, and I tasted my first real baguette, a crisp brown crust giving way to a slightly chewy, rather loosely textured pale yellow interior, with a faint reminder of wheat and yeast in the odor and taste. Yum. We followed our meal with a leisurely dessert of fromage blanc and ended with a strong, dark café filtre. The waiter placed before us a cup topped with a metal canister, which contained coffee grounds 
and boiling water. With some urging by us impatient drinkers, the water eventually filtered down into the cup below. It was fun, and it provided a distinctive dark brew. Paul paid the bill and chatted with the maitre d', telling him how much he looked forward to going to back to Paris for the first time in 18 years. The maitre d' smiled as he scribbled something on the back of the card. Tiens, he said, handing it to me. The Durand family, who owned La Couronne, also owned a restaurant in Paris called La Tuite, which he explained while Paul translated. On the card, he had scribbled a note of introduction for us. Merci, monsieur, I said with a flash of courage and an accent that sounded bad even to me. The, nader, the waiter nodded as if it were nothing and moved off to greet some new customers. Paul and I floated out the door into the brilliant sunshine and cool air. Our first lunch together in, pa in France had been absolute perfection. It was the most exciting meal of my life. Not bad. Here's another excerpt, which again gives you some of the flavor of the time. On November 5th, they're in Paris now, on November 5th, a banner headline in the International Herald Tribune proclaimed that Harry S. Truman had been elected president, defeating Thomas Dewey at the 11th hour. Paul and I, devoted Democrats, were exultant. My father, Big John McWilliams, a staunchly conservative Republican, was horrified. And one side note here that she doesn't mention, they were... Paul was a Democratic administration appointee. If Tr Dewey had won, they would probably have had to go home. And there would be no Julia Child, I suspect. So even if you're not a Truman fan, this is a pop positive consequence of Truman's election. Pop was a wonderful man on many accounts. But our different worldviews were a source of tension that made family visits uncomfortable for me and miserable for Paul. My mother, Caro, who had died from the effects of high blood pressure, and now my stepmother, Philadelphia McWilliams, known as Phyla, were apolitical, but went along with whatever Pop said for the sake of domestic harmony. 